Hello there, friends, and welcome to another episode on Dune Lore. After a lot of thinking on what would make more sense to cover after three videos on Arrakis, the Spice and the Worms, I arrived at the conclusion that the Bene Gesserit are, after all, a decent topic. Now, I'm definitely not gonna cover all there is to know about the Bene Gesserit in just one video. That's simply not possible unless the video is like four hours long. In fact, I estimate about four or five videos to cover them properly. So, today, because it is kind of a gimmick of mine to start with early histories, we are gonna take a look at the ancient history of the Bene Gesserit. It was also my opinion that this topic can double as an introduction of sorts to elements of Earth history from the Dune universe. Fun fact, the Bene Gesserit had their hands in pretty much all the major periods of history, and if you like, you can even take a few guesses at which personalities are referred to in this overview. I know I will definitely take some guesses as well. Don't forget to stand till the end and take your chance to shape the future of the series. Far into the future, discovered in the Rackus Horde, are the Shiga Wire tapes of our Lady and Mother Ganima's Book of the Voices, which present to us a possible Bene Gesserit history sketching back into Terran prehistory. Apparently, the order that became known as the Bene Gesserit originated in the rituals of a Terran group, migrating from the central plains of a major landmass, east and south around the sea through areas remembered by the voices as Harappa and Mesopotamia, carrying within them the genetic capacity for group consciousness within the family type. The voices report that after millennia of migration, the males eventually lost the group consciousness ability, but continued to carry latent genes for the trait. Anthropolinguist Maro Gapato of the University of Paquita theorizes that the male latency was caused by psychological repression, since evidence indicates that the trait was actually dominant in males. As the number of women in whom the trait remained active also decreased, the family group developed rituals, traditions, and eventually religious structures to perpetuate the memory of group consciousness. Gradually, a serious problem arose. The active females only retain the memories of past active females, thus losing half of the personal history of the family. In case you're a little bit confused, this group consciousness was pretty much the ability to recall the histories of past family members all the way through the ages. And thus was born a desire to breed an active male strain to regain complete memory and consciousness. Gapato also conjectures that the culture was matriarchal for millennia, dominated by these active trait females, controlling their society through various mother goddess religion structures. These supported both a breeding program with detailed mnemonic records, and an extensive training and indoctrination system for active females. Both the programs were embedded within primary religio-political structures, and both were disseminated through tribal migration and interracial marriage, eventually dominating two whole continents. Voice Inanna shows the active female's attitude towards death in an axiom still found in the Bene Gesserit texts. And I quote, Do not count a human dead until you've seen the body, and even then you can make a mistake. This belief in universal consciousness through transferred memory was incorporated into Terran mythos through the idioms of demonic possession and reincarnation. Voice Inanna also reports on the establishment of archives, one in a place called Nippur. These locations also became training centers for gene carriers sent into new territories as ambassadors, historians, scribes, educators, and even concubines, and later becoming schools for aristocracy of both sexes. This voice also speaks of a relatively new doctrine just becoming established in her unit, the doctrine that an activated male consciousness would be able to understand the future as well as the past. The doctrine was difficult to disseminate because it openly challenged the older permanent doctrine of a goddess, or God-directed fate. A later voice, Yuan Fei's, 
discusses the structure for which the breeding program and the training program were continued over these millennia of tribal dispersion. According to her, the gene carriers were trained through tribal units, but these units were controlled by an intertribal group called the Mudders. Within each tribe, the leading gene carrier was designated as the Great Mother. This mother title was hereditary, but it was only openly used in the few remaining matriarchal power structures. Within patriarchies, the mothers became a secret order, married to aristocratic leaders and usually having as their great mother the wife or mother of the tribal leader. Only some of the mothers, all of them the gene carriers, retained group consciousness, tribal memories, or maybe some limited prescience. Voice Yuan Face also gives the details of memory transference techniques used by the mothers, but the order has confiscated that portion of the records. We do retain some portion, however, in which the voice describes the ritualistic use of a male savior. In all the tribes, the mothers longingly proclaim the savior as a superhero who would shorten the way to a release from silence or bondage via redemption, rebirth, or rejuvenation. Using a male savior accomplished two main objectives, protection for pregnant women and provision of a cultural reminder of a better past, of a history which held a different and preferable tribal consciousness. Within their own order, the mothers developed their own desire for the power gained from a savior who could understand the future. In some southern tribes, the term applied to this savior appears to have been known as Hadarak, meaning to last or be everlasting. This is a term which Gapato links to the Bene Gesserit of later days and their own term of Kwisatz Hadarak. From Voice of Vangu comes the account of a near savior in her own era, a man from the northeast of the Great Sea, the result of 12 centuries of careful breeding. He conquered much of the territory surrounding the Great Sea, reuniting gene carriers which were separated for centuries. During his empire, a great library was established, staffed by southern women trained for mnemonic breeding chart retrieval. These women integrated the lost charts into their own, forming the tradition that would later become the Bene Gesserit Summa. When the empire collapsed with the death of its emperor, communication survived among a core of mothers, who continued directing the re-established breeding charts. I think we can safely say that this refers to Alexander the Great. This core of mothers was eventually directed by a unit from a northwestern territory, a unit originally outside of the coalition, but a part of a power structure that would later dominate the same geographical area. Voice Cornelia tells of what must be the prototype Bene Gesserit group. She cites the political oddity of her society, a republican form of government granting citizenship to aristocratic women, as the major reason why these gene carriers were able to organize a cohesive and lasting structure. Her group bore the name of the Bene Gesserit. But to the members of the organization, this name meant women who bear well, who strive to breed a savior, a living god, to activate the female-slash-male consciousness of the past, the present, and the future. These women were well aware of the political power of such a person, a power that could eliminate both internal and external threats to their nation. The next voice, Claudia, details the Bene Gesserit's elaborate training program for women, who, with their military husbands, would colonize conquered territory. These missionaries then contacted a northern family unit, which had retained active consciousness within selected men as well as within women. Although Voice Claudia's nation enslaved the newfound unit, their bloodlines were introduced into the breeding charts. From what Voice Claudia explains of the Bene Gesserit's intricate political and educational structures, it is understandable that they would dominate the more loosely structured coalition of gene bearers. Voice Claudia also describes the history of another potential, and probable, active trait male in her territory. This one declared himself a living god-emperor, and from marriage to Bene Gesserit Livia, 
he produced several generations of active trade males. I think we can safely assume this guy was the Roman Emperor Augustus, also known as the First Emperor. Now, from among his offspring, at least one appears to have been the first known abomination, which is a man who hears Erdag's voices and claims to be both male and female, but whose actions were so perverse that voice Claudia refuses to describe them. She does say, however, that Beni Gesserat then prohibited certain memory transference practices and began training new procedures to safeguard active females against the possibility of possession. Voice Claudia recited the prohibition against abomination, and I quote, In the male and female consciousness there reside personalities of such evil and such power that they endanger the entire species. They stand ready to dominate any untrained soul. When one soul becomes dominated, possessed by such an ancestral evil, it becomes an abomination, a fleshy house inhabited by a monster. For such a soul, immediate death is the only release. The period when the Bene Gesserat was active seems unusually well populated by tribal saviors. From the southern unit came a savior strong enough to produce disciples proselytizing deep into the northern territories. Voices continue reports of his power, but our analysis of the entity is inhibited by the Holy Church's impounding of all reference made to this figure in the tapes which have been translated. This guy was probably none other than Jesus Christ. Another active male was reported by voice Morfud to have known both the ancient past and the distant future. His lineage shows a conjunction of the Beni Gesserat lines of power with the newer northern family lines. This particular male, Voice Morfu tells us, rejected the role of savior, choosing to be an advisor to a king rather than the king himself. She also notes that his powers were transferred through folk myth to the leader whom he served, a man known for millennia in his culture as the once and future king. Once again, I think we can assume that the previously mentioned savior was Merlin. The Apato surmises from the voices after Morfood that these reincarnation and resurrection myths reflect a family group within which an active male strain existed for some centuries at the very least. When the genealogies transmitted by these voices are incorporated into the Summa breeding program, the Reverend Mother Maurius Iris Coppolin hopes to be able to trace some of the more influential lines into the active lines produced by our empire, perhaps even to Leto II himself. The next dozen or so voices report an extensive period of female subjugation in both northern and southern cultures. The southern culture was ruled by a heavily patriarchal family empire, its women's breeder groups functioning primarily through a harem system, built on communication links with extended families. But even within the harem, the group continued an extensive, although covert, training and breeding system. The northern unit had less success in maintaining continuity during the period. When the empire governed by the Beni Gesserat nation collapsed, the northern group was separated from the southern group, and its own internal communication deteriorated. Political strife fragmented the territories held by the empire, and made continuity of training north of the Great Sea almost impossible. Some brief reunion with the South came when Mother Eleanor, accompanying her husband and king on an extensive political excursion into the South, used her time to restore some communications with the South. Unfortunately, this linkage was brief, and after Mother Eleanor's death, the Northern groups fragmented, losing any union with each other as well as with the South. The only continuity left was all found in two groups separated by socio-political boundary. The aristocracies continued to intermarry, and the remnants of the old Beni Gesserat attempted to continue secretly breeding and training within the extended families. Occasionally, some aristocratic breeder would gain political power, such as the woman who briefly held a dominant ecclesiastical position. But, in general, the order had to do its work via its husbands and sons. Voice Helga Matra suggests that not only did this organization follow the programs established by the Beni Gesserat missionaries, 
but that it also practiced the sciences of the day, particularly the medical skills. But she also notes that political disruptions left pockets of the uninitiated and the untrained active women, who, after centuries of alienation, were forced to interpret the evidence of their abilities within the patriarchal religious mythos of their territory. These women, hearing Erdag's voices, often went insane, and in the process were either venerated or executed by their neighbors. Their fates heavily dependent on the interpretation of their local priesthood. I think we can safely assume that these practices relate to hunting witches in the Middle Ages. Voice Blanche Therese tells of one such woman whose voices drove her to become a national hero. She was then martyred for defending her prince in battle, probably none other than Joan of Arc. The Northern Branch also became active in conquering and colonizing territories in newly discovered through more advanced navigational skill. This activity brought both of the northern gene-carrying groups together under social conditions which allowed their reunion. They also became involved with two more family types, each one carrying similar genetic traits. The family inhabiting the conquer territory was almost annihilated by the conquerors, and the new genes were not successfully integrated into the general breeding pattern for several centuries. Voice Mawaganawa gives some history of the second family group, one set in a slave position within the conquering society. She talks of the long and painful period needed to resolve hostilities between these two groups of women. The integration of the four groups not only renewed the vigor of the original breeding line, but also added genetic characteristics, which enhanced this culture's eventual technological progress. It is voice Suzette commenting on the rejuvenation of the Bene Gesserit by breeders in the Northern Territories. Her era saw the formation of women's groups that sought openly to produce a savior. Voice Lucien says that eventually the North gained a self-proclaimed savior, a man born out of the peasant gene carriers and educated in the ancient tradition. He also believed himself a god-emperor and set about to gain an empire. His conquest reunited the northern and southern gene carriers, reopening communication through the female espionage agents he placed in the harem system. He also sought through intermarriage of the aristocracy of the north to reunite the two northern lines. From women within the harems and women within the northern Bene Gesserit was established the so-called Bene Gesserit, its mother house located in, of all places, Wallachia an area at the junction of the northern and southern units. Wallachia, if you don't know why it's funny, is actually a region in Romania. And it was here that the southern and northern breeding records were reunited in an updated Suma. The old Bene Gesserit training programs were reactivated across the north and sent to the newly occupied territories across the western ocean. Voice Maria reports that within three centuries, the northern and southern units had been integrated. Both units remained a secret, but while the southern unit retained its traditional harem structure, the northern one operated under the guise of an educational religious order, providing cloistered education for aristocratic females and occupational training for working class females. I think that this one definitely refers to nunneries. The northern culture experienced an improvement of technology, leading within less than a century to radical social revision. The mother house recognized the usefulness of technology and then trained women to gain powerful positions within the northern group, particularly in the more advanced western group. One women's group in the western territory became independent of the mother house, calling themselves daughters and trying to assert political claims by making their breeding charts the basis for social acceptability. They publicized their breeding charts, set standards of etiquette, bred male children for political office, and viciously attacked units of the mother organization. These ones no longer believed in group consciousness, and they bred for a purely secular savior, trying to nullify the power of any other breeding group. Within the next two and a half centuries, the mother house had successfully excommunicated them, deprived them of public validity, 
and retained only the breeders who had not participated in the splinter group. For information concerning this technological era, the reports of free voices become very valuable. Voice Mora Macum details the work done with early thought machines, which the sisterhood saw as an expedient means of streamlining their own breeding program. The mother house kept its own mnemonic records of the charts, into which the machine program breeding charts were integrated, allowing for more complex experimental breeding patterns. Voice Sierra Kaikilani describes at length the infiltration of the controllers of the thought machines by the sisterhood. She was a chief programmer for the off Terran exploration undertaken by a political coalition of the northern, southern and western powers. It appears then that a mother house, through Voicier and other women like her, used this expedition to develop the eventual seeding and breeding plans for off Terran colonization. Voice Glenna Rich tells of the first global attempt to regularize the structure and training of the so-called Bene Gesserit, as they were now known. Since Wallachia had lost its name and political integrity, an extensive underground network of women working within their separate political jurisdictions developed centers where breeders were educated, where breeding charts were maintained, and where new skills like psycholinguistic analysis were developed. It was also at this time that the Southern Unit had finally emerged from its millennia of political stasis to compete as an equal political power, also strengthened by control of a major energy source. And thus, the women of the South were finally free to join the Sisterhood as active participants. Another interesting point made by voice Glenna concerns the process used for memory activation among the Reverend Mothers of the time. Apparently, a rapidly developing chemistry would simplify the psychological and physiological memory transference process. Up to that point, transferences were controlled mainly via non-chemical, physiological and psychological training techniques. Although records are a bit fragmentary here, we have Voice Glenna's description of a radical southern Bene Gesserit unit that developed a chemical stimulant to activate latent males, and in the process produced a savior figure who led a jihad to rid the world of corrupt modern infidels. After years of devastating war in the southern territory, the Mother House finally effected an assassination which eliminated the core of the Jihad. Voice Glenna also comments on the Northern Radical Unit who sought a chemical process to activate the male memory within an active female. This unit would argue that males were actually unsuitable saviors, having failed in that role over the millennia of the family's development. They planned to collect, flash freeze, and store breeder semen and then to eliminate men entirely. The mother house also dispatched this unit before they could implement their theory. Much time was required to complete the global network, during which women gained some public power, even governing for brief periods here and there. For the mother house, this was a time to establish strong educational units in politically powerful societies. The schools developed some basic training that would be used by the Bene Gesserit for millennia afterwards, well into the more modern times, in an interesting combination of Eastern, Southern, and Northern training techniques. And this, my friends, has been what I wanted to tell you about the ancient and all the way to the pre-space colonization period of the Bene Gesserit's history for today. Now, I do apologize if this chunk of information is a bit dense. But, like with many aspects of the Dune universe, there are few things which are actually straightforward. For today, I wanted to ask for your opinion and vote on another matter, now that I've actually started on this important topic. Would you like me to keep at it and finish the topic, in this case the Bene Gesserit, or move on to something else, and then return to another section of Bene Gesserit lore later on. Unfortunately, with Dune, in order to understand some things properly, you gotta learn about other things first. Either way, I very much welcome your opinions and thoughts on the matter. Before I go, I would also like to thank you for supporting the series, 
and once again ask you that you keep supporting it so I can continue making it. If you didn't watch any of my other Dune videos, I suggest you check them out, they are all in the same playlist. Thank you very much for watching this one too, and have an awesome and healthy day. May the blessings of Shai Hulud be upon you.